Good day, fellow investors. We continue with our summary of the best book on investing out there. And today we touch on chapter seven, the core of a value investment philosophy, thus discussing risk. Other topics are a bottom-up strategy, absolute versus relative performance. Everyone is focused relative instead of focusing on the absolute investment performance. I believe that over the next decade, this will matter much more. And over the last 15 years, this was the only thing that matters because risk was just dissolved by the Fed. Now that risk is again a big factor, again, value investing will matter more. And we have to focus on what can go wrong first, which is even more important than what can go right. While with investors, everyone focuses on just what can go right. Let's start immediately with bottom up investing, which is opposite to the usual top down approach. When it comes to investing, everyone is talking now about inflation. It was the hot thing to do to get exposure to commodities. Of course, that was the wrong thing to do last year. Now, when it is again more interesting, now nobody cares. But then the discussion is, will the Fed hike or where to hide if the Fed hikes? And the problem is that even if you are correct on the macro picture, whether you know that there will be a great era of world peace and stability or World War III, if you are correct on the impact of this on bonds, yields, industries, stocks, and you also have to be correct at the right price before other people are correct on the macro. So great example was commodities last year, those were high, everyone was buying them, but only those that bought them in 2020 were right. And those that bought too late were wrong and lost a lot of money. That is the problem with the top-down approach. You are not buying based on value, but on concept, theme, and trend. And then you must also consider the expectations of others, the valuation and the price paid when it comes to this, which complicates a lot the investment thesis and strategy. It is much simpler to take the opposite approach, which is the value investing approach, a bottom up approach. So fundamental analysis, one by one, your investment opportunities, and then sooner or later, you will find something that fits you. It is much easier to implement. You focus on the business, not on what the Fed does. Actually, you say, whatever the Fed does, I am okay when it comes to that investment. But Sven, what if the Fed hikes? Well, if the Fed hikes, that happens, but I will get my dividends. I will reinvest at lower prices. And I have to buy at the margin of safety that we discussed last chapter so that no matter what the Fed does, I am protected. Always keep in mind that value investing, margin of safety, and until you find what you're looking for, you keep cash. That is also something very important. Sooner or later, you will find something. And when it comes to keeping cash or holding something, this is very important and very specific to Klarman, but also to Warren Buffett, even if Warren Buffett doesn't like to say. You know exactly what you bought, and if that changes, don't hold if the reason for holding is no longer valid. So Klarman is definitely against buy and hold for no reason, because as he says, Huge sums have been lost by investors who have held on to securities after the reason for owning them is no longer valid. In investing, it is never wrong to change your mind. It is only wrong to change your mind and do nothing about it. And we have also discussed this in this video. I'll put it here in the card. Buffett usually sells 9 out of 10 stocks that he Holds. So only one of the 10 he buys is the buy and hold forever. Everything else, something changes when it comes. So he doesn't like the risk and then he sells. Just think Wells Fargo, IBM, Verizon, etc., etc. Nine out of 10. The next core thing of value investing is relative versus absolute performance. Whenever it comes to investing, if you talk about investing, everyone 
will ask you, did you beat the market? Did you beat the market? For the record, I cannot even compare what I did in the last 20 years with the market. If I invested in the market, I would still be a poor kid in some East European country. But that is exactly the point of value investing. If you focus on yourself, you destroy the market. You forget about the market. You don't care about the market. But you have to forget about the market to be there. And then again, on the market comparisons, if the market does 50% down and you do 40%, are you happy? Well, every other investor there says, oh, I did beat the market, who cares? But he's still 40% down. And when it comes to value investing, value investing is about reaching your financial goals, not caring about what others do. Because Buying undervalued securities and selling when fully valued will lead to a good absolute return over time that we already discussed will allow compounding over the long term. And therefore, you cannot compare yourself to the market because the market will do better than you for a decade and then do worse than you for a decade. Over the long term, you'll do better because value investors prefer out of favor holdings that may take longer to come to fruition, but also carry less risk of loss. And this is my favorite example of value investing versus something else. This is the Nasdaq composite. Of course, 1990s, there was the dot-com bubble. Everyone was rushing into the Nasdaq, especially in the 2000s, just before the peak. And everyone was leaving Warren Buffett out. When the Nasdaq peaked, Berkshire was actually down 31%. Warren Buffett was considered old. And I don't have to tell you that in the future, Berkshire's earnings have done much better than the Nasdaq. We now again have a Nasdaq bubble. And I'm very curious how it will end. The key point here is that this performance has been done with much lower risk than anything else. And that is value investing. No matter what, you just keep compounding. And then again, something that goes against Peter Lynch forever, always fully invested because you must beat the market. If you don't have any ideas, then you just invest in the market so you will perform equally. That's what investment managers do. But absolute investors hold cash where no bargains are available. As Berkshire used to keep 160 billion in cash, 150 now significantly less because the cash was losing money. So that is very important to think about comparing, constantly comparing, okay, the risk of investments and the value and the risk of the cash. Which leads us to the next part of the value investing puzzle, which is risk and return. And when it comes to investing, it is much easier to focus on where will Tesla stock go, how much money I can make, because that is exciting. That is what makes it much easier to part with your money and invest it because you'll end up rich very, very quickly. That simply works with as humans and there is nothing we will be able to ever change about that. Only if we focus on value investing, we just drill it into ourselves, we might focus on the other side of things, which is, okay, what can go wrong when I invest my money, when I invest my future, when I invest my financial stability, everything? Do you want to get rich fast or you want safety of principle? And that's the core thing to understand when it comes to investing. 97% of people will always go for the reward. Only 3% of us that are watching this chapter 7 summary will focus on what can go wrong. This is the standard measure of risk, standard deviation. And in academia, they say that low risk gives low return, high risk, high return. And risk is defined in financial terms as the chance that an outcome or investment's actual gains will differ from an unexpected outcome or return. Quantifiably, risk is usually assessed by considering the historical behaviors and outcomes. In finance, standard deviation is a common metric 
associated with risk, which in value investing is complete bollocks. Let me explain. This, of course, works only in an efficient market and value investors, we firmly believe that it is possible to find low risk, high reward investments. And that is then the essence of not losing money and reaching a good absolute return. And that might happen because information is not widely available in that situation. So, for example, when somebody is selling or it's not looking into the accounting, looking at the real value of the assets, which is then, again, when an investment is particularly complicated to analyze, who can make days of days of research and analysis, only few. And then when investors buy and sell for reasons unrelated to value, like we have seen AT&T dividend holders dump, for example, Warner Bros or other spin-offs. So this is what the market thinks, but value investors actually believe that this is not low risk, low return. This is high risk, low return. For example, bonds that we discussed in yesterday's videos about pensions, investing in a long-term bond at the 1% return is total risk for no return. And that is exactly what risk is. If you take risk sooner or later, it erodes your return by causing losses. And therefore, we must focus on not taking risk for a good return. That's the only way to compound long term. Because by itself, risk does not create incremental return. Only price can accomplish that. Of course, the risk of an investment is described by both the probability and the potential amount of loss. The risk of an investment, the probability of an adverse outcome is partly inherent in its very nature. It is totally clear that investing in Nikola cars here is much riskier than investing in a utility with stable projected cash flows, etc. So risk, yes, depends on both the nature of investments and then, of course, on the market price. So you have to understand the nature of the investment and then compare that nature with the market price. While security analysts attempt to determine with precision the risk and return of investments, only events accomplish that. So risk cannot be described by a number. Risk cannot be projected in the future. Only now, looking back, you can understand better if something happens, then it is risky. If it works, it is not risky. If I tell people that Tesla has been risky since ever, Nobody believes me because they look at look at what they did, look at the market share, look at this, look at that. And then you say, okay, Tesla is not risk. If something fails, if Tesla would have failed, then it would have been considered risky. There are only a few things investors can do to counteract risk. Diversify adequately, hedge when appropriate, and invest with a margin of safety. It is precisely because we do not and cannot know all the risks of an investment that we strive to invest at a discount. The bargain element helps to provide a cushion when things go wrong. So the core of value investing, margin of safety, even when things go wrong, you want your protection of value, of principle, of wealth, of whatever you are investing in. Therefore, if you buy at a discount, even if things go wrong and that value changes, as we have discussed, you are okay. Which is completely opposite with academics, the beta that was very, very cool, still unfortunately used, where it compares the securities portfolio with its historical price fluctuations, comparing those with the market as a whole. High beta stocks are defined as those that tend to rise by a higher percentage than the average stock in a rising market and decline more than the average stock in a falling market. Due to their greater volatility, high beta stocks are deemed to be riskier than low beta stocks. This is a great example. This is Freeport McMoran. We discussed copper miners recently versus the S&P 500 index. And you can see that when the market goes up, FSX goes up more, 
when the market goes down, FCX goes down more, which then gives it a higher beta and therefore everyone says higher risk compared to the market. However, they only look at fast price fundamentals and not at fundamentals at all, which ignores the price. And despite the beta, I would say that at some price levels, Freeport McMoran, given the copper, given the nature of the business, is less riskier than the market for a higher return. That's value investing. And the reality is that fast security prices do not reliably predict future investment performance. And therefore, it's a poor measure of risk. And you can read a lot of academic papers on that, how it is completely dismantled. But it's good to sell 250,000 education MBAs around the world. The next step is discussing the relevance of temporary price fluctuations. Risk is, of course, the probability of loss long term. But that does not mean that your investment cannot go up and down. We have to be able to distinguish between short-term price fluctuations and changes in business fundamentals. And that is something that is only obvious about the fact. But if you are buying sound value at a discount, do short-term price fluctuations matter? In the long run, they do not matter much. Value will ultimately be reflected in the price of a security Indeed, ironically, the long-term investment implication of price fluctuations is in the opposite direction from the near market impact. For example, short-term price declines actually enhance the return of value investors. So if prices go down and if there is value, your returns will be higher because Mr. Market can create very attractive opportunities to buy and sell. Great conclusion here. The primary goal of value investors is to avoid losing money. Three elements of a value investment strategy make achievement of that goal possible. A bottom-up approach, searching for low-risk bargains one at a time through fundamental analysis is the surest way I know to avoid losing money. An absolute performance orientation is consistent with loss avoidance. A relative performance orientation is not. Finally, Paying careful attention to risk, the probability and the amount of loss due to permanent value impairments will help investors avoid losing money. So long as the generating portfolio cash inflow is not inconsistent with earning acceptable returns, investors can reduce the opportunity cost resulting from interim price declines and even as they achieve their long-term investment goals. Smash that like button if you enjoyed, subscribe if you haven't. I'll see you next week with chapter 8, the art of business valuation from a value investment perspective.